Greetings. Do kids still say greetings? I haven't been in this dimension for a very long time, but we must drop everything I've been working on at once and discuss why Stanford Philbrick Pines, my old pal, is the best character in Gravity Falls. In the immortal words of Jason Ritter, aka Dipper Pines, Gravity Falls is real and it will never die. And 12 years after the show first aired on Disney Channel, I can safely say that's true. The series is, quite simply, an S-tiered masterpiece. Think The Simpsons meets Twin Peaks meets Disney, and somehow this unholy trinity creates an iconic show that is a masterclass in great television. Legendary for its exciting writing, beautiful animation, and memorable characters, the story is about two 12-year-old twins, Dipper and Mabel Pines, who go to visit their great uncle, or Grunkle Stan, one summer in the sleepy lumberjack town of Gravity Falls, Oregon. While working at their uncle's house turned tourist trap, the two encounter spooky paranormal creatures, get into wacky hijinks, and have the adventure of a lifetime as they attempt to uncover the secrets of Gravity Falls. Although discussing the show's legacy could be a video in and of itself, the main aspect I want to focus on today is a deep dive into discussing its memorable characters, specifically the best character in the show, the author of the journals and Grunkle Stan's long-lost twin brother, Ford Pines. Before we go any further, I want to point out that best here is not the same as favorite. True, my favorite character happens to be Ford, but when I first watched the show, I think Bill Cipher was my favorite character, and I really didn't like Ford. But over time, with rewatches, engaging more fandom meta-analyses, fanfiction, and reading the pivotal ancillary product that is the canon copy of Journal 3, I began to love him and more deeply understand his pivotal role in the show. In fact, it was this rewatchability that made me consider the importance of how great characters can stand up to multiple readings that layer in complexity and gain greater depth upon revisiting. Thus, best here is going to be defined as someone who is excellent in their own right as a memorable, relatable character with their own motivations, fears, desires, and a generally interesting personality, but also as one whose arc actually reflects the themes of the show and is absolutely integral to the plot and relationships for other characters. In short, the best character is important not only because they can be a favorite character, but because they are the most important to the story on a fundamental level. So, let's dissect Ford in a way that would be worthy of our own journal entry. Firstly, let's talk about his development, because according to the creator of the show, Alex Hirsch, on the official DVD commentary, Ford was extremely difficult to figure out. For most of the show, the author primarily functioned more as a plot device rather than a fully fleshed out character, since most episodes essentially present a problem in which Dipper will consult the journal and then move forward to face the obstacles, resolve the conflict, etc. As a result, the writing team had a variety of different directions they brainstormed for his character. There's a version of a bit more hippie Ford, a more nerdy Poindexter Ford, and so on. They even toyed with the idea of Ford being someone to root against, as they had already established Grunkle Stan as one of the beloved main characters of the show, but they felt like having Ford ultimately be a good person who gets along with Dipper and Mabel would be even more infuriating to Stan. Therefore, the writing team essentially set out to create a man who was a winner in all the ways Grunkle Stan was a loser in life. Not to mention, of course, it was a great choice to layer in more nuance to the story by having Ford be someone who the audience could empathize with, as he isn't inherently a bad person. In short, Ford was designed to bring out the maximum frustration in Stan and bring out the most amount of conflict in the Pines family larger story. As a result, he's Dipper's hero, Stan's rival, and his presence marks the beginning of a literal and emotional rift in the Pines family, as he is also the one to suggest the separation of Mabel and Dipper. As Hirsch said, Ford was very much us building backwards. The same way you know a black hole is there by the light warped around it, it's like, you know, the damage someone's family has done to them by all their weird tics and behaviors. So who is the character who would result in Stan being this hurt and needy and mad and also longing? And so we came up with this guy who kind of seemed too perfect and is distant. He's aloof and distant and he's too perfect. And it's like, oh, I think he's also aloof and distant from himself. All that being said, it's kind of an amazing feat that they worked backwards to create him, as getting the author right was absolutely critical to the show, since the central mystery is, of course, who is the author of the journals. So the writing team absolutely had to nail making a solid character who could hold up to the anticipation that the entire show had regarding his revelation. Which brings us to the first point of why Ford is the best character. Without him, there is literally no show. Ford's actions before, during, and after the series' main front story or core narrative impact every single part of the series. Without Ford, Stan wouldn't have been kicked out of his home for breaking Ford's science fair project, or have the core dream of sailing around the world with his brother, or have lived in Gravity Falls for 30 years, and therefore Dipper and Mabel would never have visited him. Not to mention post-show, Stan wouldn't have gotten his happy ending on the Santa War 2. Old Man McGucket wouldn't have lost his mind after building a machine to erase his memory of viewing the other side of the portal, and also end up in Gravity Falls. And speaking of Gravity Falls, the entire town wouldn't have had their minds regularly erased. Bill Cipher wouldn't have been summoned, become the enemy of the Pines family, and basically all Weird Mageddon wouldn't have happened. Stan literally calls Ford out on this in the finale when he mentions that everyone thinks his brother's a hero, but he's the one who literally brought about the end of the world through the stuff he was messing with. And of course, the journals wouldn't have been written, and therefore Gideon wouldn't have found Journal 2, Dipper wouldn't have found Journal 3, and the systemic understanding of the anomalies in town and magical abuse of power wouldn't have happened. In short, Ford is THE catalyst for the entire narrative, and his absence is felt in the show by all the other characters. Which leads me to my second point. Ford's presence brings out the mystery elements of the show, deepens character insight, and serves as a foil for the main cast. 
Firstly, by the use of presence here, Ford has two types, literal screen time and emotional screen time. By literal screen time, I'm referring to times when the audience literally sees Ford appear in the show. I did the math, and over the entire 40-episode run, Ford only has about 8% of literal screen time, and even that's a stretch. And that, for the majority, takes place in the last 20% of the entire show. In fact, if I had one critique, it would simply be that I wanted more Ford in the series, especially since the ancillary merchandise in Disney's official canon copy of Journal 3 gives him way more literal screen time and fleshes out his character even further. Plus, of course, we can see a Ford in the tie-in graphic novel Lost Legends. But the show makes up for the lack of literal screen time with how much emotional screen time Ford occupies for the viewers and other characters. By this, I mean the time the main cast is focused on Ford, despite him not being physically present. Character introductions are important, and although we get the, one of the most epic ones in his literal reveal, as Stan says he's the author of the journal's My Brother, his first introduction actually occurs in the pilot episode, as soon as Dipper finds the mysterious journal out in the woods, when he first asks the question of who wrote it. This introduction serves, of course, to also introduce the audience to the central question of the show, who is the author of the journals, which is one of the show's most lasting memeable legacies. But it also introduces the character of the author, making viewers and cast members alike ask what type of person he is if he writes things like trust no one, studies anomalies, and so much more, including making things like body switching carpets. Furthermore, the show also asks the second biggest mystery of the show in that pilot that I think a lot of people have forgotten about over time, which is, what is Grunkle Stan hiding, as he disappears behind the vetting machine at the end of the very first episode? And Ford is essentially the answer to both of these questions. He is, of course, the author, but he's also the person who built the portal to the other dimensions, and it is Stan's goal to rebuild said portal and rescue his brother. Thus, Ford is also critical to understanding Grunkle Stan's character, and deepens the audience's insight into Stan's tragic backstory of losing his brother, and understanding his ghost or the source of his psychological and moral weakness, according to John Truby's Anatomy of a Story. As Hirsch puts it in the DVD commentary, Stan looks like he's having a good time, but has a huge wall of sadness, loss of human connection. He has a need to please get lost in the crowd because he's trying to get from them the affection he never got from his family and lost from his brother. Which, speaking of Stan's goal to repair the portal, it is Mabel's decision, representing the choice of heart over the head, as symbolized by Dipper, to trust Grunkle Stan that brings Ford back. This is particularly interesting as Ford returning to Gravity Falls is the start of the literal rift for the universe and the metaphorical rift in the family, as his relationship with Stan serves as a foil to Dipper and Mabel's relationship. His presence is also the potential cause of a future rift, as he is the one who brings up the offer of an apprenticeship to Dipper and therefore sets up the emotional stakes of the show. Will trust, family, and belonging slash acceptance win out with Dipper and Mabel? Or will their story echo Stan and Ford's 30-year-long rift that has been categorized by paranoia, betrayal, and isolation? Not to mention some crazy grudges. Although actually, I guess it's more like 40 years, because it's 30 years in the portal, and Stan says he hasn't seen his brother in 10 years. So like, four, almost 40 years. We'll say 40 years. A 40 year long rift. <laughs> Moreover, Ford serves as a character foil to the younger twins. This show sets up the obvious parallels Ford has with Dipper, as both love mysteries, adventure, and investigating the paranormal. However, Ford and Mabel also have some interesting parallels, as they are both the older twins and love art and creativity. Although, of course, the best foil for Ford's character is seen in contrasting him with Stan. As previously mentioned, Ford was designed to be a winner in life in all the ways Stan wasn't. But there are some fascinating parallels between their characters as a whole. Ford's journey is, in many ways, a classic hero's journey, where he views himself as the chosen one to change the world before he pivots to being the chosen one to destroy Bill once he finds out he's been betrayed by the evil triangle. In comparison, Stan's arc is, in many ways, the path of the rejected one. He's not accepted by his own family, he's been to prison three times, and clearly doesn't have many friends, if any. This makes the story's turn of Stanley being the heroic scoundrel with a heart of gold, and Ford being the one who helps the true hero succeed in his quest to protect his family, a fascinating plot twist. And that's before we even begin discussing the interesting bisection between the Stan twins' personalities. Hirsch stated in DVD commentary that the design of their childhood bedroom intentionally showed where their interests overlapped, and the comic book definitely expanded upon this idea. Both twins are incredibly intelligent, brave, creative, enjoy risk-taking, and have a knack for getting into trouble, have a protective streak on mild wide, are artistically talented, and possess a loose moral compass to say the least. They also both clearly love monster stories and enjoy exploring aspects of the paranormal. Another great example of this is seen in the crimes both have committed. As evidenced by the show, the journal, and the comic book, both possess a criminal record that indicates neither are above breaking the law to get what they need to survive. And it shows that while Stan is on the run in the US, and outside of it, at least in Colombia, Ford effectively followed the exact same path but in the multiverse. Although, of course, there are points where they converge and show their different takes on the same topic. For instance, Ford views Stan's mystery shack as a making a mockery of his profession, as seen as his reaction in the journal as, quote, Unbelievable. Once a haven of scientific study, the cabin I built with my grant money has been transformed by Stanley over the years into a hokey freak show that mocks everything about the study of the paranormal. But clearly, they're two sides of the same coin. Ford enjoys the scientific side of discovering real paranormal creatures, while Stan creates anomalies for tourists to safely enjoy while making a quick buck. 
As a result, although Ford doesn't get a lot of literal screen time, his emotional screen time absolutely dominates the show. And that, combined with his literal screen time, means that his influence is enormous in the story. It is due to his lack of literal presence that the show's core mysteries exist, and once he appears on screen, the insight into Grunkle Stan's tragic character is deepened, the Pines family rift is heightened, and all the characteristics of the main characters are contrasted. This leads into my final point, that as a character, Ford is, simply, amazingly well-written, complex, and interesting in his own right. And it is his character arc, more than any of the other characters, that embodies the core themes of the show. To be honest here, Journal 3 was critical for me to understand Ford beyond the series, but the fandom also played a key part in making me understand his character's full story and characterization, since Ford's minimal, literal screen time in my first run-through didn't give me as much to work with in terms of understanding his perspective versus the other characters in the show, specifically Grunkle Stan. And Ford's story is just as tragic. During his childhood, he was relentlessly bullied for his six fingers and failed to make any friends aside from his twin brother. In the journal entries Ford makes about himself, he writes, Where I grew up, we were encouraged to follow rules and fit the mold. I recall finding a shrunken head in the family pawn shop and bringing it to show and tell. Every other student brought a football, a football trophy, or a book about football. All of these objects were thrown at me as I gave my report. If my brother hadn't shielded me and punched one of the other kids in the nose, I might have spent the rest of the year in the hospital. When I was growing up, nothing I ever did was right. My grades were too high and my social skills were too low. Worst of all, I was born with a rare birth defect, six fingers on each hand. Although my family tried to convince me that this made me special, and it did help with shadow puppets, I was mocked by classmates and shunned by girls. I would hide in the library, poring over books about the supernatural and searching for other freaks of the world like me. This serves to establish Ford's character, as Hirsch put it in one interview, as someone who is deeply, deeply hiding from his real feelings about things. Because at some point early on, he decided that he could run from hurt by achievement and by creation, and has dug a hole so deep that he has no relationships. He doesn't have friendships, he doesn't have romantic relationships, he is someone trapped in a tower of his own mind and estranged. Ford's low self-esteem is further detailed in this excellent Tumblr post that explains, Ford's automatic assumption is that everyone hates him. His default method of making friends is trying his hardest to impress them, while simultaneously revealing little to no information about himself. Because trust no one is just another way of saying no one cares about you. Remember Dipper's monologue at the end of episode 1 about how he was going to keep trusting Mabel because she cared about him? Because the poor kid got relentlessly bullied anytime he tried to express himself or talk about his interests. Remember show and tell? Because he'd rather disappear off the face of the earth than deal with another betrayal. Because the people he picks to be his friends always betray him, and why wouldn't they? Thus, it's easy to see why Ford would perceive himself to be betrayed by his only friend and twin brother during high school. Ford's breakdown in this relationship laid the foundation for his later trust issues, as he viewed Stan as someone who ruined his future by not supporting his dreams, not taking responsibility for his actions, and riding on his coattails, rather than understanding Ford's desire to carve out a space for himself to be accepted in the wider world beyond his brother. Additionally, this story sets up Ford's weakness, his pride, as he was unable to express his gratitude for his brother bringing him back from the multiverse after 30 years and giving him the belonging he always had. In college, Ford found a friend in Fiddleford, and after McGucka agrees to join Ford in building the portal, Ford characterized his emotional state as one that was overcome with emotion. The sight of his old classmate upon his doorstep this morning filled his heart with such joy and gratitude. After all these years of self-imposed solitude, how wonderful it is to have a friend by his side. He must do his best to make Fiddleford feel at home. Thus, this makes the perceived betrayal of Fiddleford not wanting to continue on with the project even more heartbreaking, as it layers in another round of trust issues for Ford, who clearly believes he is a lone outcast and has chosen to embrace this designation versus vocalizing his true desire and need for acceptance and belonging. Additionally, Fiddleford's weakness of being too compassionate and avoiding issues rather than facing them head-on exacerbated Ford's weakness of pride and arrogance once their relationship broke down over their argument regarding shutting down the portal. This is further emphasized in the journal as Ford writes, Well, good riddance, Seth, you weak-willed hayseed. Go back to your doting family in a life of fear and compromise. I weep now not for our failed partnership, but for the golden opportunity thrown away. To think I considered him a friend. I know my true friend. It is my muse. I will speak with him tonight. I will seek his counsel. Of course, this sets up Ford's third and final betrayal of trust, and the reason he writes trust no one in the journals to begin with, that of his former muse and mortal enemy, Bill Cipher. Although the show briefly touches on this in episode 15, the journal details the depths of Ford's despair even more explicitly. Before Bill's betrayal, Ford is extremely complimentary of Bill, writing statements such as, Bill has proven himself to be one of the friendliest and most trustworthy individuals I have ever encountered in my life. What a guy! I honestly couldn't trust him more. Not ever, in any way. Bill is a true gentleman. He also mentions that Bill is one of his favorite constellations, and he even has a study dedicated to Bill artifacts. In short, Ford views Bill as the only being who understands him, supports his scientific dreams, and provides his ultimate need of receiving acceptance from the wider world. All things that he thought he had with Stan and Fiddleford. However, Bill, of course, is a master con man and manipulator, although the fandom is quick to point out Bill's title as that of an abuser. He isolated Ford from his real community, made Ford feel special and that he could only rely on Bill for true understanding of reality, and also physically and mentally harmed Ford once his true intentions were revealed. 
As Hirsch puts it, we knew that psychologically that Ford is not traveling his path alone. He's traveling it with his muse, who he has a very complex and f***ed up relationship with. And even in Ford's private thoughts, he would not say, I'm alone. He would say, oh, I have a very important relationship with my life with Bill, but I don't have a friend. Ford's not alone in his mind, even though he is extraordinarily alone. The foundations for getting in Ford's head can be seen by the fact that Bill is the only other character in the show that uses Sixer, Stan's childhood nickname for Ford. By integrating himself by exploiting Ford's emotional vulnerabilities, it makes even more sense for why Ford would agree to let Bill possess his body while he slept. Of course, after Bill's betrayal is known, it makes this level of intimacy with his abuser become a nightmare. Quotes such as, My right eye is so sore it bleeds on the page, the cost of letting him possess me. And, But far more important is to prevent Bill from entering my mind again. I realize that the only way to do this is try to sleep as little as possible. Any moment I close my eyes, he may try to control me again. Clearly demonstrates how Ford's physical and mental health rapidly deteriorates once he decides to fight against his abuser. Most notably, when Ford accidentally falls asleep at a truck stop to try and gain some peace from Bill, he writes, Everyone in the diner turned towards me, and perhaps it was just the sunrise coming in through the window. But that moment, I swear, all their eyes were glowing yellow. I screamed, get out of my mind, Cypher, and ran towards home as fast as my weak legs could carry me. No one in this town can be trusted. He has eyes everywhere, and they are watching my every move. And all of this doesn't even mention the fact that Bill casually altered Ford's mindscape without his consent, including messing with Ford's vocabulary without him knowing. And all of this paranoia and betrayal culminates in one of the most famous pages in the series, in which his paranoia reaches the point of him desperately writing, Trust no one, can't sleep. What's interesting here is that this is another way the show emphasizes the fact that Stan is perfectly designed to balance out Ford's weaknesses. The parallels between Stan and Bill, like this Tumblr post points out, are for another day, but Stan's gruff, tough love approach makes it clear that he wouldn't have been fooled by Bill's tricks to begin with and would have been able to help Ford before he descended to this level of madness if he had been called sooner. As Hirsch put it in an interview, Stan and Ford are, quote, really, really funny because they both have major, major blind spots. I can kind of write stories about them as a duo forever because you can always excuse them both getting hyped on a bad idea for their own reasons and then you can always come up with a reason for them to disagree about it. And it's always sweet to see them come together again because they're so full of themselves, but they are both so damaged they desperately need each other. All of this, of course, culminates in Ford's mistakes throwing him into the multiverse for 30 years. However, as this Tumblr post points out, Ford is deeply flawed, realizes those flaws, almost got himself in the universe destroyed, and what's the first thing he does? Whine? Complain? No. This vengeful, nerdy Banff goes on a 30-year redemption arc to stop Bill, knowing he could spend the time getting home, but instead choosing to use that time to redeem himself at the expense of his own life and freedom. Ford's journeys throughout the multiverse are similarly detailed in Journal 3, but all of them continue to demonstrate the commitment of a man desperate to atone for his mistakes, even as he still believes in going it alone. Indeed, even after his return to Gravity Falls, Ford's difficulty in trusting others and wanting to save the world alone is noted several times. For instance, Dipper comments that Ford had never believed the Zodiac legend before. Apparently, he couldn't believe that saving the world involved so much getting along with others, but he thought it was finally worth a try. And when Ford reflects on his nightmare visit from Bill in episode 15, he writes, Our family is in danger, and I have to do something about it. I have been hesitant, however, to talk to the rest of the Pines about Bill, even Dipper, who I've grown to trust. I'd like to believe this is out of a desire to protect them, but if I'm honest with myself, it's because I'm ashamed. What would they think of me if they knew it was my folly, my hubris, that conjured Bill in the first place, that he tricked me into creating the portal, and that the rift is a direct physical reminder of the terrible deal I made so many years ago? Would Dipper still look up to me, or would he consider me a fool? No, I need not tell them everything. Not to mention Ford's last entry before he attempts to shoot Bill and Weir McGeddon reads, I pray that if we fail, others will take up this fight. The fate of the world, the fate of the entire universe depends on it. This may be the last time that I write in this journal or any journal ever again. I know I have made many mistakes in my life, but I pray that I can finally make things right. However, these journal entries merely emphasize the fact that Ford's hero's journey is realizing he is not the hero, but the hero's brother, and how you must learn humility and how to trust others. Indeed, the end of Journal 3 includes Ford's thoughts post Weirmageddon, which explicitly detail the lessons he learned and embody the core messages of the series itself, including such quotes as, Looking back on my lifetime of catastrophic mistakes, I realized one great pattern in all my follies. I thought being a great man meant being alone, apart from the crowd. I bristled at the idea of sharing my accomplishments with anyone. Even when I was given a second chance, I still held others at a distance. If I had been able to widen my circle of trust, we might have gathered everyone together and banished Bill before he was able to strike. I just couldn't get over the idea of myself as the lone hero, and it was Stanley who paid the price. Trust no one. What an absurd and paranoid idea. Trust shouldn't be given unconditionally, but it should be given a chance to be earned. There is strength in having the humility to work with and sacrifice for others, a strength I now realize was in my brother all along. If I'm totally honest, I must admit that he's a hero, and I'm a hero's brother, and I'm okay with that. And when he talks to the Ford post Weird Mageddon, he writes, 
that they talked about our family members and how his had turned their backs on him when he had lost his mind. I encouraged him to reach out to them. No matter how hard it is, everyone deserves a chance at having a family. Amazing, it took me so long to understand this. And finally, at the very end of the journal, Ford closes with, if you're holding this book in your hands, you hold something more than a record of the curious happenings of a town called Gravity Falls. You hold a record of one man's folly and the kindness of a family that saved him from himself. It's never too late to learn that growing old doesn't have to mean growing up. Stay curious, stay weird, stay kind, and don't let anyone ever tell you you aren't smart or brave or worthy enough. Thus, Ford's story can be summed up as one of abuse, low self-esteem, pride, arrogance, and a crippling amount of guilt over his mistakes, but also as one of a heroic, courageous, intelligent protagonist who seeks to atone for his actions before ultimately receiving redemption, forgiveness, and grace from his family and friends. In short, his character arc embodies the core themes of the show. And if all of that wasn't enough, Ford is also hilarious. I mean, after that beautiful summation about staying weird and kind, he signs off the journal with, and if anyone ever gets in your way, well, we have an entire section on curses. How about it? Like, do not, this man, this man, I can't. He also definitely still lives in the 1980s, like this and this and this show. Luckily, I'm here to take this mess off your hands, but I'll need all of your floppy disks and uh, eight tracks, right? Not to mention that the episode immediately after his reveal, he is delightfully demystified from his status as the enigmatic author and like mysterious epic figure TM to world's nerdiest old man. And that's just good stuff. Thus, it's quite clear that the more you dig into Ford as a standalone character in his own right, the more rich and complex he becomes. As all well-written characters should be, he is relatable and memorable through his flaws and his virtues. Plus, he's an old nerd who tells uncle jokes and offers a zillion opportunities for the fandom to do meta-analysis on his character like this post. He stands up to analysis and scrutiny, and it's also just plain fun to see him on screen. Consequently, although Ford may not be everyone's favorite character, it is clear that he deserves the title of best character, Gravity Falls. It is through him that the audience and the main characters get the answers to the biggest mysteries of Gravity Falls. His presence deepens character insight and provides a foil for the rest of the Pines family. His actions forward the narrative of the story before, during, and after the main show's over. And his entire hero's brother's journey embodies the themes of the narrative. Therefore, next time you watch Gravity Falls, because it is real and it will never die, spare a thought for old Forzy and why he's the best character on the show. Because if this was any other show, he'd be the hero rather than the hero's brother. And he's okay with that. Also on a final note, Ford wears amazingly sensible fashion, okay? Because I've definitely unironically worn a turtleneck in July because it really was that cold in the Pacific Northwest. And rod turtlenecks will never go out of fashion.